Good morning. Good to have you. Good to be here. Good to have y'all. Syllabus is in the back back there if you don't have one. Make sure we're all on the same page. I'm letting them come in. Earl Ferb told me. Did you hear about the blonde who got hurt raking leaves? She fell out of the tree. (laughs) I was listening to Dr. David Jeremiah this week and uh, he's been preaching on end times and stuff and so I pick I I like Dr. Jeremiah and uh, he was saying that the preacher was preaching and he said behold I come quickly And then he went blank for the next rest of it. So he just kind of gathered himself. He said, behold, I come quickly. And he went blank again. So he paused, did something with his papers, tried to get him people saying, well, he's doing something rather than losing his mindset. (laughs) He said, and he came up to the front, I behold, I come quickly. And when he did that, he fell off the platform. And he landed in this elderly lady's lap. And he said, oh, I'm so sorry. She said, oh, don't worry about it. You warned us three times. (laughs) Okay, Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. As we go through this, it should get easier and easier as we go through Galatians. At least I'm praying it is. This tough little book. And a lot of law. And uh, we just went through the allegory, which was difficult, but understandable. And so we, uh, we hope that this will be a blessing to you. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1 says this. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Stand fast, therefore. Paul begins his personal challenge to the Galatians. He previously told them to expel, kick out, kick out the law, Hagar, Ishmael, the flesh, and the performance system. Instead, they were to E.M. embrace the grace system which was represented, if you'll remember, by Sarah, Abraham, Promise, Isaac, and Faith. Free gift system. The choice for their life was legalism or L-I-B, liberty. You know, that's the choice today among a lot of churches. Uh, If a church is really strict, narrow, it goes by personal preferences, very legalistic, Or you have a church here that loves God, wants to live holy, but they have liberty and freedom in Christ. And uh, it comes more out of devotion rather than out of duty. And I remember when I went over here, First Southern, uh, they believed in tithing and everything like most churches do. And and, uh, also uh, they were death on eating out on Sundays. 
And, uh, I mean, they were strict on it. And uh, I, Carol and I would go over here to the old, what was it, Carol? Just right. Just right here on 31. And uh, we'd sneak over there on Sundays. And uh, we'd sit real low. <laughs> In case they go down 31, they couldn't see us. <laughs> they really made you feel guilty. <laughs> you ever have a church make you feel guilty? I mean, really guilty? And, uh, well, so anyway, he says, Paul's wanting them to, to, of course, choose liberty and grace, doesn't he? It states, number two, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. Paul says our practice, our lifestyle, our behavior, our everyday living coincides with what Christ provided for us in him. Our new, N-E-W, our new position is in grace. Thus we are not to, R-E, retreat to be under the legalistic pressures from which Christ hath made us free, especially the law's demands with its curse. Why in the world would you get saved by grace and then place yourself under that kind of bondage? Uh, that's what Paul is saying here. And uh, notice he says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith. It wasn't available for us which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified, how? By faith. But after that faith, when we get saved, is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. We're not under the law in our everyday living. And so Paul says, you've been delivered from that. You've already proved you couldn't keep it anyway. <laughs> So what I want you to do is place yourself out from that. Now learn what I've been sharing with you about the body of Christ, a heavenly people, and how we are to live today. And uh, so Paul's trying to get them from, from being going back to that law. Romans there, of course, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Now, uh, it doesn't take a great grammar expert to read that verse that says, for ye are not under law, but under grace. <laughs> uh, do you get that? That's what he's saying to him. So you're not under that. This new freedom in Christ is not a LIC license to sin, but to help us fulfill his will in our lives. One, it is free from having to sin. Romans says, being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. For the first time in your life, you're not controlled by your flesh or by the law or by the world or the devil. Now you have the ability to make a choice. You can choose to live for Christ. Whereas before you just had the spirit and your own strength in making these decisions. But now, since you've been saved, you have the Spirit of God. And through the Spirit of God, the Word of God, now you have some ammunition to put on the armor of God that you might be able to withstand when the world, the flesh, and the devil comes knocking your way, right? And so now we, can, we have the freedom to make the right choice. Two, it is free from the law's bondage. And the law was bondage. It was not intended to give life. It was intended to show people they were sinners. It was intended to show people they needed somebody outside of themselves. God. <laughs> Amen. They needed to go outside of him without the demands, the rules to obey in order to be accepted or in order to be spiritual. That's why uh, in my circles, the Baptist circles back in the old days, uh, you were always judged by how strict you were. 
rather than the freedom, liberty of living for Christ because you desire to live for Christ. And, uh, you know, they say, we don't do that at our church, brother. <laughs> and uh, it used to be awful, but it's, it's uh, reversing the day, though, isn't it? Today, churches are going to license. Anything goes. You can do just about what you want. There are no consequences. You have freedom. That's not what grace does. Grace teaches us to live godly. And we'll see, we'll see that. Romans 8, 2, For the law of the Spirit of life in Jesus Christ hath made us free from the law of sin and death. All the law ever brought back, it showed that you're a sinner, and sin always brings death, whether it's in your life actions or in the end. <laughs> Three, it is free from self-bondage. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should, you should obey it and the lust thereof. Like I said, now we can make choices. But people are good at self-bondage. Some people love to place themselves under so many rules to tell them exactly what to do. People can't live on their own. Read the Bible. This is what the Bible says. This is what I do. Rather, they would like to see those list of rules. Then when I keep them, um, I feel that I'm spiritual. Or if I don't, the self-bondage, the guilt, the shame, the beating yourself up begins to take place, doesn't it? You ever been there as a Christian? Notice the poem. Free from the law, O oh happy condition, Jesus both bled and there is remission. Cursed by the law and bruised by the fall, grace hath redeemed us once for all. <laughs> grace moves, M-O-V-E-S. Grace moves in us to live godly. And we share these verses quite often with people because I think it just shows you what we're talking about. Titus chapter 2, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, and that grace teaching us, the grace teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. In other words, live this way until we see him come, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Grace changes our lives. Amen? You know, when you get saved, the Spirit of God comes and lives inside of you. And as you read your Bible, as you pray, as you go to church, those things, they help prop you up, encourage you, feed you, inspire you, in a sense. And uh, the Spirit, you start to do something you used to do that you knew was wrong, what happens? Like a little guidance thing inside of you. You go, uh-uh. Huh? What do you think that uh-uh is? <laughs> well, that's, that's the presence of the Spirit of God now. And through the Spirit and the grace of God working in you, that promotes you to put off some of the old habits that were sinful and put on some of the new habits that are godly that you know as you read the word would please God. Okay? It's not deep. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Isn't it amazing even though one is free in Christ they still 
will go to all lengths to bring legalism back into their lives. They still, S-T-I-L-L, think they have to do something, some kind of religious work to satisfy themselves. <laughs> some people put restrictions up on their life that God didn't give them. They place it themselves upon their lives. Oh, if I can do this, I'll be right with God. I'll be holy. I'll be spiritual. When God never called for that. B, as a result of that, they miss out on liberty we have in Christ because of what he has accomplished on our behalf. You can read Colossians sometime, okay? But notice verse 20, beginning verse 20. He nailed the ordinances to the cross. Verse 20. Whereof if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why as though living in the world are you subject to ordinances? Touch not. Can't, you can't do that. Taste not. Handle not. Which all are to perish and so on. These are the commandments and doctrines of men. And in my walk, uh, I came across a lot of times the doctrines of men. Not the doctrines that's in scripture for us to follow, but the doctrines of men. Now, sometimes, I know that's not bad. It's like when I went to Tennessee Temple, they had rules. I mean, they had rules, rules. And uh, one of the rules was hair checks. Uh, when you go into chapel on Fridays, they had guys posted, you had to go by them. And if you had hair on your ear, they'd call you up and say, you need a haircut, and they'd write your name down. Make sure next time you had a haircut. That facial hair wasn't permitted. You know, on, on, I mean, they had all kinds of rules. And uh, you look at that, and somebody said one time, they give too many rules, but when you leave there, you don't keep all those rules but you do keep some that makes you better than you were when you got there. And so some places think something that's important. They just need to explain. Now, God doesn't say this. This is just one of our rules. So you don't get mixed up that this is God's rules. <laughs> okay? Notice, as Christ hung on the cross, crucified for all the world's sins... The law was crucified with him. And now it is a dead system to the, to, to the saved people. But what does man do? Man is constantly pulling it out of the grave. They just won't leave it alone. Give me my rules. Notice C. Previously, the Galatians had been in bondage to idolatry and the law. Galatians says, Howbeit then, when ye knew, not God, when they were lost, ye did service unto them, which by nature are no gods, idolatry. But now, after that you have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again? to weak and beggarly elements, whereunto you desire again to be in bondage. He said, how stupid can you be? Huh? Why in the world, after receiving great salvation as a free gift, and he's working in your life through the Spirit and the Word of God, why in the world would you want to go back and have anything to do with that past life? So Paul here tells them, do not, do, do not let the Judaizers trap, T-R-A-P, trap you with their legalism. Do not allow them to make you a religious victim. Do not fear grace or liberty and stop letting others make unbiblical DE decisions for you. Amen. I was, as I was looking at that, uh, I was thinking of this uh, counselor, uh, 
can't think his first, his wife's name is Deidre. Botkin is his name, was a psychiatrist and written books and stuff. And he came over to biblical counseling. But then he saw biblical counseling. He saw that uh, as a means to carry on secular counseling. And they, they mixed. So he pulled away from that. And uh, he wrote a book, Biblical Counseling, No. The Word of God, Yes. And he came to a decision that was amazing. He came to the decision, when a couple's having marital problems, they've had an affair, spent all their money gambling, they're alcoholic, whatever. They come in, and he says, how can I help you? And they say, we're having marital problems. And then they start going into details. He says, oh, oh, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear anything of what's going on. Now that might sound crazy because that told him they had a deficiency in their relationship with Christ. And he knew that if he could get their relationship with Christ correct and them flowing in that, that would help with their marital problems. And that's the way he worked out. Similar, that's what grace does. Grace works in us and in a sense, in our, the more intimacy we have in our prayer life or reading the word of God, in that relation, serving God, if that relationship becomes strong and stronger, all of a sudden, I'm a better husband. I, I become a better father. Wife, mom, mate, spouse. The key is the relationship with Christ. But people want to tell why they're mad at their spouse. Have you ever noticed that? That dirty rat. <laughs> Second Timothy, here should be our attitude. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Even though they're doing this, if God peradventure will give them repentance and to acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. Didn't say to go over and start beating them up and telling them how bad they were, but to be patient, meek, be a friend. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Now just think about if that were said all the way from Matthew, Mark, the Old Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, early Acts, all the way up to Acts 15 at the Jerusalem Council. What if you said that right there? They'd try to stone you, wouldn't they? Isn't that amazing? See, Paul's teaching some new truth here to them. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you. Paul here is trying to get their attention. He is saying, hey, remember who I am? Yes, I am an apostle with God's authority, but also I am the one who knew the law inside out as a Pharisee, P-H-A-R, a Pharisee who tried, T-R-I, who tried keeping the law for righteousness. So he's telling them, I know what I'm talking about here. And you can read Philippians sometime here. Uh, it just goes, uh, Philippians 3, 3, 6. 
Philippians 3, 6 there on your page. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung. Why? That I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Paul said, hey, I was... I was a good Pharisee. I studied under the feet of a Gamaliel. Hey, I had the best teacher there was. My action, I, I persecuted the church, uh, the little flocks church. I, I did all these things. But now after I've become a Christian, I realize all that just waste. So he knew what he's talking about, didn't he? He says, number two, that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Paul is not only talking about their salvation, their justified position. He's also talking about their everyday EX experience of a believer's life. If they would go back under law, they would not get the benefits of Christ's freedom. They would lose, L-O-S-E, they would lose the ministry of the Holy Spirit from working in their lives. And that's so important. The more you're in tune with, with Christ and having intimacy with God through your life, the more he moves and works in your life. But the more you become legalistic, and that's the basis of, that you base your spirituality upon. The more you do that, you limit the spirit from being allowed to work in your life and you're grieving him. No question about it. This I say, then walk in the spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to uh, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. And boy, inside of you, you have the spirit, you have the flesh, and boy, they're vying for control of your life. And the more you yield to God, the more he pulls you to the great side of living for God. But the more you feed that flesh, it controls you and begins to limit God's working in your life. Verse 3. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Paul states that if they were going to use the legalistic rite of circumcision as a part of their salvation or sanctification, plus, P-L-U-S, Paul's gospel, they have the duty, obligation to keep all the law. It's not just pick and choose. Galatians 3.10, For as many as are the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is one, everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. If you don't follow the law to the T, you're cursed. James 2.10, for whosoever shall keep the whole law yet offend in one point, he's guilty of all. How would you like to be under those, those rules? You'd always feel like a failure every day of your life, every hour of your life. Well, I failed again. Well, I failed again. <laughs> Boy, that's, that's junk, isn't it? Two, most Judaizers... Judaizers, like most legalists, choose which laws, rules they want, W-A-N-T, they want to keep while living, the, while living, uh, leaving, I can't talk, leaving the rest. That is called hypocrisy. You pick and choose. 
Well, I'll do, I can do these. I can't do those. He, he said, hey, if you don't do all of them, you're guilty of violating all of them. Remember, it is not believing in Christ plus a few other things. That is saying Christ's work is still not enough. That upsets God. After all he has done for man in providing his son through his death, burial, and resurrection. In truth, mixing law with grace is a dispensational problem. Now, don't miss this. Too many believers and lost people keep going to areas of the Bible for information that was not put there for them. Amen? If you keep going back or forward under Israel's program, you will not find yourself out from beneath the law's system. Back here, Genesis through Acts, mid-Acts, all the prophetic program under law, all of them under law. Thank God for grace and freedom, liberty we have in Christ when he saved Paul, beginning in Acts 9, Romans through Philemon. We're under grace, we're under freedom. This is our program. These are the books that are doctrine. We learn a lot from others, but our main doctrine, how we live today, is found in Paul's epistles. When we're raptured up here, God returns dealing with Israel. The law will be there. And so what happens, here I am today, and I keep going back and reading something here, bringing that over into the dispensation of grace. And that's how legalism begins to come in upon grace. That's where you get lordship salvation. If he's not lord of all, he's not, he's not lord at all. That's what it said. And they say, he that endures unto the end, the same shall be saved. You know, you have to do this, you have to do that. Well, the reason that was said here, they were under the law. We're under grace. But if you bring that over into here, you begin to add law to grace and begin to mix it. And you come up with false doctrines like lordship salvation. Okay? Let me see here. Where am I? Three? Three B. You would be under a work system like replacement theology and messianic covenant or mosaic covenants principles of performance. You know, and that's another reason you can come up with lordship salvation is like a covenant theology, replacement theology that says that uh, the body of Christ is the spiritual Israel today. God's done with Israel. But we go back there and we take those verses and we spiritualize them and we bring them over into the gospel of grace. Remember, Paul is our apostle and his teachings are to be followed if you want correct BIB biblical blessings and fruit. Amen. Christ has become of no, no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law. Ye are fallen from grace. He says Christ has become of no effect unto you. Christ's work, his death, burial, resurrection, its value, importance is being rendered I in inoperative or of little use by the way you are living under legalism. You know, the Lord says we are to walk in how we received it. We received it by faith. We are to walk by faith, not by the law. Little use the way you are living under legalism. You are forfeiting God's true 
T-R-U-E, moving in your life without Christ and grace. If you are leaning toward and believe that works are part of your salvation, then there was no need for Christ's work. When one lives their life in the flesh, trusting their works, they shut out, they shut or limit, L-I-M, limit God's work of grace from being activated. Man has a problem doing that because man likes to pat himself on the back. <laughs> we love self-righteousness. Whosoever ye are justified by the law, for all have sinned come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, to declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. It says, believeth in Jesus. There is no legalism works tied to our salvation. It is pure grace, P-U-R-E. Also, whether keeping the law for salvation or sanctification, the legalist system, legalistic system, is an ongoing PRO process, obligation. This means no assurance now or ever, because there is always something more to do. It is never over in trying to be accepted by God under its system. So you have no assurance. Have I done enough? Did my good outweigh my bad? <laughs> It never ends. You are fallen from grace. This is a favorite verse, phrase, used by many to show you can lose, L-O-S-E, your salvation. Some say one is saved by grace, but they have to seal in, continue believing or working to keep salvation. Uh, some think that they have been in grace, but have fallen out of grace. You ever talk to somebody like that? That is impossible, and that is conditional salvation. The reason I haven't fallen from grace, I maintain a certain level of living. Thus it becomes works instead of grace. Paul is saying, if you are to put all these attachments and amendments to the gospel, then you have literally, T-U-R-N, turned your back on the grace gospel. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. In the area of growth, when saved, you place yourself under law and legalism. You are e remove yourself from the sphere of grace. This also shuts down your growth, since you would not grow unless it is according to truth. You would also lose grace for your daily living. There are two main arguments against once saved, always saved. They say, one, teaching once saved, always saved is giving one a license to sin. They should then do whatever they want, or they could do whatever they want and still be forgiven. Our answer is, Paul anticipated the people saying this, so he wrote, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. You cannot out -sin the grace of God. Aren't you glad about that? B, you can read that sometimes. Grace operates in holiness given to us by Christ. 
Romans 6, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? <laughs> grace is never, N-E-V, never a license to sin, but just the opposite. Grace teaches or helps us to have the desire to deny ungodly and worldly lust. The cross put away sin and gave us new life to live godly. And just like I said it earlier on that if here if I am saved, but then I turn my back on grace and I start putting this bondage, these attachments upon my life of legalistic man-made rules, and I'm doing that, then I'm limited, I'm limiting the grace of God from being activated and working in my life the way it should. Thus, I've fallen from grace in the way that I live, not salvation. Amen? Two, they say, you are safe and secure as long as you believe. And by the way, I've had people say to me, well, I believed once, but I don't believe anymore. So I'm lost. That's what they say. They say you are safe and secure as long as you hear the truth, be, believe the truth, and follow truth. But what happens if you quit believing? You fall from grace. That's what they say. They say when you fall from grace, it means you're lost again. Let me just say something about that. Who's going to take you out of Christ? Who has the power to do that? Not even us. Isn't that something? To be lost again, you would have to undo everything that took place when God saved you. Somebody was saying, I had one time, I don't have it right now, I was looking at a different one, but it says 33 things take place the moment you get saved. All of those would have to be zilch. I think that through. And the only reason we're saved, somebody paid the price. Who's going to pay the price to get us lost? You know, well, I got a verse down here I'll show you. Answer. When the Bible says belief or unbelief, it is referring not, to, not just to believing, but receiving Christ as your Savior. It is a one-time action. Before we were saved or after we were saved, we have what we have because of what Christ did and ACC accomplished. It, what Christ accomplished, it is never based upon our performance. Amen? It's based upon Christ's performance, whether I'm saved or not now. 2 Timothy is a great verse. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. Did you get that? Even when we lose heart and lose faith, doesn't say we've fallen from grace. It states he'll be faithful. And then one of my favorite passages, for whom he did foreknow, he knew ahead of time, he also did predestinate, to de that means to designate a certain purpose, to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many believers. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, because he foreknew them, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. 
already in the mind and purpose and degree of God, you're a finished product. He never would have started you, hello, he never would have started you unless he already determined he has finished you. You get that chain together, it's unbreakable. He foreknew you, he predestinated, he called you, he justified you, he glorified you. Already in the mind, the purpose of God, you're a done deal. That's why it says he's the author of our faith and the finisher of our faith. So once you're in Christ, I'm sorry, you can't fall out of grace. Amen? Once saved, always saved. And if you don't believe that, you believe you can lose your salvation, then what you're saying is you have to maintain a certain level of living in order to maintain it. Thus, you have brought works in, and we're not saved by one iota work we can do. We're saved by our faith in what Christ has done, and that alone. Amen? Okay. Anybody learn anything? Y'all happy this morning? You just sit there? It's good to have Bill and Jen uh, uh, back. Uh, God bless you. Good to see Coop back, back there too. Uh, these Floridians. Any more Floridians back? Anybody else? Well, we had several in the church service last week, so it's good to have a few back. A few back. I think it's supposed to start getting a little warmer now, so it shouldn't be too bad. Uh, did you just get back from Florida, Carol? Oh, okay, I just, I'm kidding her. Okay, next service starts in about 20 minutes. God bless you. We love you.